Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome back to part three of three on deep learning, what you need to know. And I mentioned last time the problem with radiomics is multiple. It has tremendous potential. I've showed you some results. But, you know, the variability. There's no standard acquisition protocols. There's no injection protocols. If it works and needs to work well, it needs to work on every scan or even scans that aren't done with dual phase, even scans that aren't injected well. But things like reconstruction algorithm, whether it's on a Siemens or a GE, whether it's thick slices or thin slices, all of these factors can make something work or not work. That's very challenging. The limitations of textual analysis, this whole variability thing, what type of reconstruction you use, do we need to control for all of these things if we're going to do radiomics? That may be something you need to do, and the protocols will have to be defined. Everyone can't do whatever they want, but ideally you wish that you would have a lot more flexibility. Now, one thing that came about, there's an article just published the other day by Choey, and they made the point that they showed that if you had a chest nod lung nodules on chest CT, and you have high res and standard algorithms, the accuracy would be significantly different. But they were able to develop a convolutional neural network-based image conversion technique that allowed all the images to be good regardless of the algorithm. And they showed, you can see at the bottom versus the, bottom versus the top. And so this idea that different reconstruction kernels could not be used interchangeably in radiomics, maybe that's not going to be the case. Now, they only did lung nodules and a little bit of variation, but it does make the point that if we really want it to work, we're going to have to have some sort of black box or some box, maybe not a black box, more open perhaps, but there needs to be a way to really put things together and put things back in place. And Park did an editorial about this in radiology and said deep learning-based approaches are expected to substantially contribute to the applicability of radiomics. The study by Cho, where he did come up with this way of uh, even taking images that weren't exactly what they needed and make them correct images, will make things indeed improved. If you look at the future of radiomics, standardization to facilitate comparison of multiple studies, large quality data sets with enough statistical power for validation of radiomics analysis. Again, most, most studies to date are relatively small. You need multi-center trials on scans from different vendors to determine the generability of the technique. And you need to integrate everything into the current workflow. So right now, we don't have it sitting where when I'm looking at a case, I can just do it. That's gonna have to happen for it to be really part of practice. Um, this article by Ho, texture analysis is a potential role in distinguishing malignant adrenal nodules from benign. So again now, let's look at the feet, let's look at what we can do, adrenal nodules. Or in this case, looking at the grade of a gist tumor. If a size is more than 10 centimeters, mitosis more than five and a half powered fields, the gist is considered high risk. If a tumor is in the small and large intestine, if a tumor exceeds 5 cm, or mitosis more than 50, 5 and 50, the tumor is high risk. But can we classify things using radiomics? And this one article made the point that using TexRad, um, it was feasible. Okay? So again, uh, you got to think about the possibilities, but if the texture works, it goes across many things. Here's one looking again at the grade of gist tumors. Again, not only detecting lesions, but doing the grade, and then you're replacing biopsy or other markers. So it's again a very cost-effective thing, yet you're giving better patient care, and perhaps it will allow you to make more decisions on what patients need to get operated on. And I think we see the same thing with neuroendocrine tumors. Not just detecting neuroendocrine tumor, but can we, based on stage, determine who we should follow and who should have surgery? There are many questions to be answered, but we have new techniques for, for answering them. And this article by Cho again, uh, CTTA parameters such as MPP and kurtosis can be useful in predicting the uh, high the risk grade and mitosis index of GIS. So that becomes very important. I mentioned also sticking with the pancreas, cystic lesions. Well, this article says you can distinguish serous cystadenomas from other cystic lesions. 
and the technique could increase preoperative diagnostic accuracy and assist clinicians in making the right decision over who to operate on and who to not operate on. And they looked at 17 different features between serous cystadenomas and non-serous cystadenomas, and you could see the features that made a difference. And the radiomics high-throughput features contained intensity, texture, wavelength, decomposition, uh, and obtained more image details that were hard to discover with the naked human ears, eyes. And that is eyes and ears, I'll take them both. The point is we're changing how we think about things. And again, this article by Ray Wee talking about the ability to improve the accuracy and diagnosis of these uh, serous cystadenomas, which are benign tumors and typically do not need surgery. Other tumors, mucinous, do need surgery. And things can look the same, both in location and lesion appearance. And again, it's not just a pancreas. It's not just CT. This was with PET-CT, FDG PET of the brain, using this to predict early Alzheimer's disease. High sensitivity, high specificity. Very impressive work. And in this work by Ding, the ability to really pick things up early, the algorithm performance on a more general population is needed, but you can see there's lots of interest and lots of potential. In that article by Yim Ding, they makes the point that the study proposes a working deep learning approaches and a set of convolutional neural network hyperparameters validated on a public data set that can be the groundwork for further improvement. So we're doing better, but we're not there. Now I mentioned to you before the whole thing about companies. Who's the best company? I'll speak about that. But you gotta go with the Googles of the world, not the traditional medical companies. Google just published this a week ago, something called Smiley, which allows them to look at pathology slides and be very accurate. And what they show is with two articles, one, how they did it, and B, how they changed it based on what pathologists wanted. Pathologists just did not want to show me the same case, but show me features that are the same. And they just wanted to label it, and then the computer should show me more visual patterns, similar images, different results, and then once they trained it and the physicians liked it and it became much more user-friendly, then the, then the people using it, the physicians liked it a whole lot better, okay? And so Google, this article by Hegde, makes the point that our findings add to the body of evidence that sophisticated machine learning algorithms need to be paired with human-centered design and interactive tooling in order to be most useful. 100% correct. We're not going away. We're here, and we can help the computer do better. But the computer can surely help us do better, and it's going to be the symbiosis that works so nicely. Now, there have been articles like this one about from Eric Topol, used to be at Cleveland Clinic, now he's in a big foundation in San Diego, talking about the use of AI, the uh, ability to look at big data, which enhances information across the spectrum, in medicine, there is beginning to have an impact at three levels for clinicians, predominantly by rapid, accurate image interpretation. For health systems, improving workflow and the potential for reducing medical errors. And for patients, by enabling them to process their own data to promote health. Each of these things is critically important, and each of these things is very, very possible. Now, the second thing is the generation of data in massive quantities from sources such as imaging, biosensors, genome, electronic medical records, limits on analysis of such data by humans alone have clearly been exceeded, necessitating an increased reliance on machines. You can't look at all of these signatures. You may not recognize them. And if you recognize, you want to look through 30 years of people who are residents and fellows who may have been interested. You want to find out everything you can to be able to do things different. We need to really rethink how we're doing the process. And you could argue in terms of pancreas as just one example. Right now we're on the top where we look and we make a diagnosis. Soon the computer will be telling you, look here, look there, do this, do that. I don't think we're going to be replacing us anytime soon. But at the bottom, at some point, it may be able to say, hey, I see something. Here is what it is. Call the, you know, it can call a surgeon just as well as you can. It can give the differential. It could do the findings. Everything can indeed happen. 
And I don't think it's going to happen over the next year, but it'll take a few years for it to happen. Stephen Hawking's a great quote, success in creating AI would be the biggest event in human history, and fortunately might also be the last, unless we learn how to avoid the risks. And I think we need to look at the medical side as being very positive. Now, people at times get very critical about the theoretical aspects of being put out of business. Well, I think there's plenty of work. I think we're going to have more work than ever. I think we're going to have true computer assistance, which makes you more and more valuable. So I think that part's going to be great. I think the process is very exciting. And I think, as we spoke in, in Australia, it's important for radiologists and radiology technologists to pay attention to get involved in the process because it's coming. We're only arguing over when. There's excellent stuff on CTSS on our webpage. We have an entire thing on deep learning. We have lectures. This lecture will sit there eventually. We have diagrams. We have material from meetings and companies. And we think that there's a lot of information. And I think you can sit back and say, AI is not bothering me today. I'm not worrying about it. When it gets here, we'll get here. I'm not saying to worry, but I'm saying think about how it's going to affect your practice, how it's going to affect how we take care of the studies, how it's going to affect how we treat our patients. It's going to affect every level of everything we do. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Bye-bye. If you liked what you heard here today, please make sure to hit that subscribe button and visit our website, ctss.com, for lectures, quizzes, pearls, and more. Also, be sure to check out our apps that are available for free on the Apple Store. All links are in the description box below.